Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Deviant Mind. This is your host, Dominica. And this is Chris. And we are having part two of our Murder, She Wrote <laughs> uh, series <laughs> with another woman who is allegedly, she's on trial, so we she has not been yet found guilty. But this is the case of uh, Corey Richens, Richens, and Eric Richens. A, she is a self-published grief book author. Um, she is also a uh, house flipper and realtor developer from Utah who is accused of poisoning her husband, Eric, uh, with fentanyl. And yes. she's currently on trial. Or as she calls it, the Michael Jackson stuff. <laughs> the Michael Jackson stuff. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, it's interesting when you do new ongoing cases like this, it's kind of sometimes hard to find information about the defendant as the police uh, document warrant for her arrest, call it. Um, because, you know, it's interesting because she's a private citizen. And so uh, it was definitely kind of hard to dig stuff up from her. But did you, 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 you are usually the documentary watcher. Have you heard any people talk about, well, I know this case is again, all about money, but right. um, any uh, discussion about <laughs> Any pathologies she might have, like narcissism, sociopath? Um, I again, mean, it's interesting because uh, she was born in 1990, uh, Corey was. And, which is crazy. <laughs> which is crazy, right? 1990. <laughs> Welcome to feeling old. <laughs> yeah, oh, God. Okay. <laughs> um, I say that for myself, not for you. You're a young Oh, for me. I was in high school, so I don't know. I, no, I think you're younger than I am. I don't know. No, I don't, anyway. That's another mystery we have to solve. Exactly. But uh, no background uh, to be found. However, I found she was uh, mainly raised by uh, her mom. And I think she does have a couple of siblings. Uh, and her father was an alcoholic uh, who uh, lived in North Carolina and had been arrested for a DUI. And he died died at the age of 57 in 2010. Oh, uh, okay. So, so I don't um, know anything about her siblings. Uh, I know nothing about her mom, but I do know that about her father. Okay. Now, I did find out that she uh, does hold a bachelor's degree in healthcare administration from Weber State University and a master's degree in human resources from Utah State University. Mm -hmm. And she always dreamed of becoming an entrepreneur because, you know, that's, yes, absolutely. And this was before she met Eric. And uh, she had some spurts of success. In 2011, she opened up a housekeeping service called Curry Darden Housekeeping Services, and that's no longer a thing. And then she also worked for her own for her own real estate company named Corey Rishens Realty. And obviously note the change of the last name. So obviously at that point she had been married and she focused on purchasing, flipping and selling luxury homes. And she also did have brief stints in healthcare, including working as an administrator at Park City Hospital and as an enhanced patient services and specialty clinic trainer at Park City Medical Center. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you know, uh, and then Eric Richens, her husband, uh, you know, we'll get back to her. Well, actually, let me just say this about her being a realtor. Apparently, she got in trouble a couple of times uh, for selling properties, which later uh, the buyers found to have mold. Oh, and, I saw that. Yeah, mold yeah, in her so, in in their kids' bedroom down in yes. the basement. Oh my god, it's just terrible. So that happened a, a couple of times with uh, to her, but uh, I believe at this point, you know, her husband certainly has a lot of money, and I don't. I think these were just kind of drops in the bucket for her. I don't know if she paid a fine or whatever, but. It certainly didn't revoke her real estate license, like these few cases of mold and stuff. 
Right. Now it seems, and I guess the way we usually start is we do talk about the victim. And this time we started talking about her because it was hard to find anything on her. Mm -hmm. But um, we can talk about Eric, who this is all happening in Utah. And it seems that there are very well known family around those parts. They are, uh, he was a devout Mormon. Um, as was his family. So he was born on May 13th, 1982 in Bountiful, Utah. And his family was a big ranching family. His mom and dad were Gina and Linda Carter Richens. Um, He loved his family, hunting, ranching, and he was also driven to be an entrepreneur. Um, He was the eldest son and he enjoyed working with horses and cows and his childhood was spent working on the ranch with his dad. And I found out that he was hauling hay, feeding the animals, mending fences. He mm-hmm. loved his family. Um, he was a uh, pretty serious and devoted athlete. He coached or assisted, coached all of his boys teams. So this uh, couple, uh, which again, we said this was his second wife, uh, Corey, they yeah. had three children at the time of his death, uh, Carter nine, Ashton seven, and Weston five. And, uh, you know, loved his boys and supposedly is the reason why he wanted to make the marriage work, even though he was planning to file for divorce. Um, yeah, going back, he also attended the ADS Mormon church, as you said, he, he was, yeah. and he had a two year, uh, he served as a mission in New Mexico, a missionary. And is uh, it in New Mexico or in Mexico City? I saw New Mexico. Okay, maybe I maybe I did that wrong. Um, and then okay. after that goes for uh, he goes uh, for a master's degree, I believe, in um, in business. Uh, and then, yeah, around the time, I guess he's he's married. He's a contractor. He soon becomes a contractor. There's also his family's business. And, uh, yeah, let's get into his first relationship, which is interesting. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, his, uh, so, and then becomes a con- he becomes a contractor. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, is obviously working alongside his family's business. But let's get back. You mentioned his first relationship and his three children. Well, no, actually, his three children were with Corey. Um, oh, his first relationship, right. yeah, his his first relationship ended up in divorce, and Ms. sadly, his, well, and his first wife ended up being tragically killed in a car accident. Yeah, but because of that relationship, his mother definitely told him to have a prenup, which is exactly what he did with Corey. Um, with Corey, exactly. Yeah. So they had a prenup now. So. You know, he's this guy, he's he's running his own masonry business. They're working on high-end homes. He's doing intricate stonework, pavers, tile work, and he is great with relationships. So he's coming from wealth. So meanwhile, Corey, they meet at a Home Depot uh, through a family friend named Linda King. Now, I don't want to be throwing any shade because you got to have a job. So that's, you know... That's just what you got to do. Yeah. However, this guy is working on uh, multi-million dollar homes. He's from a massive ranch, which I'm assuming is worth some multi-million dollars. And, um, you know, yeah, I don't, people. yeah, I don't want to call her, you know, a, a gold digger, but at the same time, as we see later, she starts siphoning money out of his accounts. Right. And so it kind of feels like, again, all the power to you. If you find a rich husband and you love each other, that's great. That's awesome. By, by, so by all accounts, first off, his first wife's name, uh, just so we can recognize it, is Julie Jorgensen. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, before her uh, death, uh, apparently, apparently it was a really rough divorce, very rough divorce, uh, lots of fighting. But yeah, he does decide to work at Home Depot. And from what I understand, she would go into Home Depot and he never had the courage he he took he was attracted to her but apparently he had a bunch of friends that were like go ask her go ask her out that's what i that's what i found out was uh he was kind of pushing to being like hey do you want to go out sometime but i don't think she knew going into home depot his status well no but she i believe she worked at home depot not him 
Was she the Home Depot? Did yeah. Yeah, she she was. So Linda King worked with Corey at Home Depot and she because she was a family friend of the of, of Eric's family. And then it was the other way around. He was yeah. there and he befriended the Home Depot people. I guess. Well, she was a family. She was uh, Linda King. She said that she was um, an older lady. So I'm thinking she was probably friends with with the parents. She's like, go talk to him. Go talk to him. Right. Yeah. And she said that he was this. And I have a quote from Linda King saying, quote, he was the sweetest guy. And to me, he seemed like one of my kids. He was just the sweetest guy. He was so nice to all of his employees and everybody. So. I think was for thinking he was Home Depot. I mixed them yeah, up. Yeah. So 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 she was kind of integral to introducing them. Yeah. Um, and they married on June fifteenth, two thousand and thirteen, in the backyard yeah. of their camas home. But I'm assuming it was actually his camas home. Now this camas home is also worth um quite a bit of money. Yeah. Um so Things. Um, so awesome. they get you married in- she has a master's in customer service. <laughs> right. I don't know if you right. mentioned that she has a bachelor's in healthcare and then she went from uh, her master's in customer service. In customer service, yeah. So she does have a master's degree. Um, it just kind of shows where we're at in our United States world right now that a person with a master's degree is working in Home yeah. Depot again. No judgment. It's just like, that's a whole lot of degrees. Um, Let's get back but, to the moms uh, wanting him to have a prenup. Because that's what's fascinating, I think. Well, I mean, because this is his second marriage, and obviously he does have quite a bit of money at this point. Um, I could, you know, just because, as you said, the divorce was so difficult. Um, he probably... Uh, wanted to protect himself and the way that they did it was that um they had the premarital per, 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 sorry premarital agreement on June 15th 2013 and it established that each did not have rights to one another's quote present or future income property or assets except if Eric Richens died while the two were lawfully married and well, yes. his- so it's it's no money if they get a divorce for either one of them but if one of them passes away before the other, the widow gets it all. That's so correct. correct. Goes both ways. Yeah, yeah. And his partnership interest in his uh, masonry company, which was doing very well, that would transfer to Curry Richens. That's what the court document said. And also, um, the premarital property was the Camus home, which is worth a couple million dollars. So she didn't get the house uh, if they divorced. Right. So. That was the premarital agreement and everything's going well. You know, they're having kids. He loves his wife. He's so happy to be a dad. Um, However, things go a little funky because per probate court, well, should we say, why don't we go to what happened on the night of his death? And then maybe we can go back to what investigators discovered and why they actually arrested Corey in the first place. Should sure. we do it that way? One other thing okay. to note is that uh, he took out a life insurance, which went to Corey and his business mm-hmm. initially. Yes. So we'll see that change. But yeah, uh, the night of his death is is really weird. Incidentally, I think it's uh, 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 2022. They have their, their, they have the boys. Uh, anyways, let's, yeah, let's flash forward to 2020. Cause I think this is uh, 2022. So, so he, he died um, in 2022. Okay. Um, so Maybe 2020 where we had the first incident. We had the first incident. Also, there were some finan- financial issues, but let's start with what happened on um the early hours of March 4th, 2022, um, and March 3rd, 2022. So she, Corey, wanted to purchase and flip a $2 million property that Eric was not into, but it looks like she did close on the home. So she decided to make her husband, Eric, 
a Moscow mule in the Incidentally, kitchen. Incidentally, he wanted he did not want her to get the property. That is correct. He felt that it was way too expensive. And it, I mean, I saw a picture of it. It's like 11 bedrooms. It's massive. massive. Um, it's 11,000 yeah. square feet, but it's also not finished, which is a key thing. So um, it didn't look like it had any finishes. It looked like it had just the um, uh, the framing up mm-hmm. and m- looked like maybe the sheetrock was up. It had some plywood already up, but nothing else. So. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously the foundation was done. This is like me going back to when I was an architect. Cause yes, I did work as an architect like 30 years ago. Um, 25, sorry. I didn't mean to age myself like that. Um, so it looked like, I don't know, 20%, 30% done, but there was still a lot of work to do it. And it was massive. So he thought it was too expensive. They had an argument, but That night, March 3rd, she made him a Moscow mule in the kitchen and brought it to their bedroom where he consumed it while sitting in bed. Now, that was supposedly a congratulatory drink. Mm -hmm. Um, She also gave him a THC gummy, Mm -hmm. which I found very interesting because I thought Mormons did not drink alcohol, nor did they do drugs. But that's, you know, like an aside. Um. But so they were the only people in the house and their children. So she said that she went to bed shortly after, but then one of the children, um, they were having a night terror. So she told the police that she woke up around 3 Mm a.m. Oh, uh, so she actually, before she shortly after they went to bed at around um, 2,100 hours, which is what, uh, I guess, 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Um, right. She heard one of her children screaming, screaming. So she went into the child's room and ended up falling asleep in their bed. Then she said she awoke around 3 a.m. on March 4th and came back to the bedroom and found Eric... Uh, passed out at the foot of the bed on the floor and he was cold to the touch. And that's when she said that she called 911 and the Summit County Sheriff's deputies and EMS staff responded to their residence by 322. So there was 22 minutes that between when she found him and when she called 911 and when they got there. So one of the things that the police noticed as they started their investigation was that she claimed in her official statement to the police that when she left her room to go to her child's room, that she left her phone plugged in next to their bed and did not take it to the child's room. Mm -hmm. Um, But then she said, uh, when she found him, she called 911 from her cell phone. However, when, of course, the police started investigating, they found that the status on her phone showed that it was locked and unlocked multiple times and that there was also movement recorded on the phone and also that the defendant's phone showed that there were messages that were sent and received during that time and those messages had been deleted. Yeah. So, again, we're having cell phone uh data that is essentially proving her story incorrect that she had been in her child's room the entire time while her husband was dying now I believe she i believe she claimed that she kept going back and forth now, according to her story she never actually passed out in the bed she would lay down in the bed get up and go back to him get up well, and but, go back to the kid uh, But that's interesting because then why couldn't she, I mean, her husband was, I believe, found at the foot of the bed. So why is she not checking in on him? Like her story seemed really weird, which of course. Her story was that she kept checking on Eric and then going back into the room uh, with the boy having the night terrors and then going back and forth. So she claims. So she claims. Now, I did also read in some news articles that she claimed that she was in the child's bed the entire time. The entire time. Yes. Yeah. So again, we're seeing that her story is changing. Her story changed. And then her phone is moving. Um, and then when the autopsy happens, 
they find out that Eric died from an overdose of fentanyl and he had five times the lethal dose in yeah. his system. And what the uh, medical examiner also found out that it was illicit fentanyl and not medical grade fentanyl and that the fentanyl he ingested orally. Now, when um, the police started talking to his family, because he had sisters and and uh, um, his mom, I, I don't, I'm not sure if well, his, his mom dad passed away, I believe. Oh, okay, so maybe it was just the sisters. The sister. sisters said it's the wife yeah. because, and this is where it gets a little wacky, is that she had tried to poison him before. Yeah. So there was um, specifically one of his sisters told um, the, the police in an interview that Eric and Corey had taken a trip to Greece. And this was a while back. And this is uh, a quote from the years, sister. This is two years prior to his death. Two years prior to his death. Um, according to a sister, Eric and his wife went to Greece a few years ago. And after his wife gave him a drink, he became violently ill and called his sister saying he believed his wife had tried to kill him. This is in the warrant itself. And that's the first time. Then on Valentine's Day of 2022, his wife brought him a sandwich, and this is also a quote from the um, warrant, which after one bite, Eric broke into hives and couldn't breathe. He used his son's EpiPen as well as Benadryl before passing out for several hours. So yeah. that's the second time. Um, and then the third time, obviously, uh, was a success uh, for her, uh, allegedly. So... When the investigators, uh, of course, once they found out there was a toxicology, was that he died of fentanyl, that he died under suspicious circumstances, there was a search warrant that was obtained for Eric and Corey's residence. And during that search warrant, they grabbed Corey's phone and several computers. And then they also had warrants for any and all electronic devices and information uh, to be downloaded. So when they found, and went through Corey's phone, they found uh, messages between her and a person identified only as CL. So yeah. he's not been identified. So when they um, when they ran a background check on this CL, they found that this person had multiple counts of possession of a controlled substance, substance with intent to distribute. Um, and that on, uh, that he w had been found in, uh, possession of drug paraphernalia. So if I may also, yes. uh, just to throw this in there after the attempt in 2020, uh, Eric drew up a new loss of life trust and took Corey off of it and he left it all to his sister. So that's, yes. that's the other thing. And Corey doesn't know about that. But things try to things try to go back to normal. He is very devoted to her, even after you know this that incident. Uh, and then jumping forward to uh, this CL, she initially approached him asking for painkillers, uh, hydrocodone, uh, for one of her clients. That was initially how she came into contact, saying, "Hey, my client has a back problem. Do you have any of this?" And it just kept escalating. So she was obviously trying, and I believe the first time of the hydrocodone was that Valentine's Day when she makes him a poisonous sandwich. Yes, well, um, so she was contacting him between December 2021 and February 2022, and he actually said that he left the pills in a house that she was flipping. Yes. And, um, and so there was an exchange, and then that's when... Uh, two weeks later, she said that her investor wanted something stronger and asked for some, quote, some of the Michael Jackson stuff, end quote. Um, and the Corey was asking for fentanyl. And so she actually procured 15 to 30 fentanyl pills from this dealer on February 11th, 2022. $900. And so, $900. Yes. That's so, absolutely so I'm thinking actually that she uh, 
that the fentanyl was that February 14th poisoning. And I'm wondering if she tried to poison him sometime around Christmas time that we just don't know about that sure. he didn't tell his family about. Because it is also, incidentally, it is uh, the Valentine the Valentine's Day sandwich. Uh, he passes out, and then uh, it's then he feels he's at risk of being killed for his money. And he told his friends and family in confidence that if he dies, she did it. Yeah, but again, yeah. He stays with her. He's very devoted, and ultimately, it's because he's hesitant to get a divorce after his last divorce experience. Right. And also he has three boys under the age of 10. So um, it seemed that family was so very important to him that he wanted to try to make it work as much as possible. Now, before this, one other reason why he was thinking of um, divorcing her was that he found out that she had been stealing a ton of money from his accounts to cover her debts in flipping houses. And this is per a probate court petition documents. So he found out that in 2020, Corey had taken out 100K from his accounts and ran up $30,000 of debt on credit cards. He then also found out that she borrowed $250,000 using a fraudulent power of attorney. She forged his initials on documents that she could act on his behalf. And he did confront her in 2020. And she admitted to taking that money when when he confronted her. Mm -hmm. Then also, as you said, in January 2022, Corey secretly logged into Eric's life insurance account and changed the beneficiary from Cody Wright, which was his business partner in the masonry business, to herself. Yeah. But as we know... When that change happens, you always get an email. So Eric got an email. He was alerted to that charge and he changed it back to Cody Wright. She also is accused of taking at least $80,000 um, from his accounts that it was were supposed to be paying for his federal taxes yeah. and at least $54,000 for his state taxes. And they haven't yet discovered what she used that money for. And that she um, also was uh, supposedly having an affair, which is what Eric told oh, his family and friends. That I, didn't, um, that I didn't discover. Yes. So there was never any names mentioned, but he said he's, she's stealing my money and she's having an affair. Wow. And um, the spokesman for the Richens family said that, quote, there is no question that their marriage was on the rocks. And, quote, we believe that Corey took some steps to manipulate their marital assets because of that. And we also believe that she took his life because of that. Mm -hmm. So that is the statement from the attorney. And uh, Rich uh, Corey was charged on May 8th with criminal homicide, aggravated murder, a first degree felony, two counts of possession of a controlled substance and uh, one possession of a controlled substance. And um, she also, there was a charge amended on May 18th saying that she was intent to distribute, which I'm assuming is like she was right. meaning to. Uh, she had a lot of uh, stuff there. And also uh, she uh, apparently assaults Katie. Uh, Katie is uh, Eric's sister. Uh, overpower of attorney. Yes. Because uh, his sister, because Katie gets full, you know, power of attorney and. Uh, so there was actually all this, uh, it's, it's kind of stunning in that one of the things that happens is Corey winds up suing the family, uh, the mom and, and Katie, over what she feels is rightfully hers because Eric died before her. Even after all this, which is like mind blowing. Or maybe she, maybe it was in the, maybe predated perhaps uh, his death. But there was always this volatile, you know, they were very volatile. Like they, it, there was always something up from the time they got married until the very end, especially well, Kate, who was really in the doubt of everything. Yes. And also another thing that I discovered was that on March 5th, which is literally a day and a half after her husband kills over and dies, she mm -hmm. closes that deal. It was actually a 20,000 square foot mansion, not 11,000. And she, she partied. partied. She invited friends over yeah. and um, she drank. Yeah. And then 
she uh that's around the time that she finds out that uh eric had removed her from his will and made katie power of attorney and so that's when she sued her for control of the estates and um so you know they were going back and forth saying that the sisters said that he didn't want to tell Corey he removed her from his will because he believed she might kill him for the money which is what yeah. you know allegedly she did mm-hmm. and he wanted to make sure that he you know uh there was financial security for their children um and of course Corey is saying that her the prenuptial agreement because they were still married at the time she is entitled to those assets now mind you that house that she's living in with her three kids were also um that was his property That's that his property. sister owns. So yeah. her financials became very tenuous. And this is where we go to the murder she wrote. So she writes a book. She self-publishes oh, it. Let me just throw in one other thing. Yes. CL is interviewed and he actually admits that he sold drugs to her. So there's yeah. that. Yeah. No, no, I mean there's, there's never any amb- ambiguity with regards to this CL being her drug connection. Oh, right, exactly. And it's just, you know, a matter of in in this place, the Court of Justice, right? Somebody's innocent until proven guilty in court. Uh, but it seems that the um, prosecutor has a pretty good case against her right now. Yeah. Um, she wrote a book called Are You With Me, which was a grieving book that she wrote for her children to help them deal with his passing. And she actually went on to KTVX in April 2023, which is a month before she was arre- uh, arrested uh, on their Good Things Utah show to discuss her book. So she was really working on making a name for herself in the grieving community. Um, and then she was arrested a month later for actually killing her husband. So what's crazy is, a, he's illustrated in the book. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, B, she dedicates the book to him. Then when she goes on TV, she shows, like, if you want, you guys got to watch this interview. Uh, if you're out there listening, uh, you got to listen, you got to watch this interview. She's smiling during the interview. Uh, no emotion. She's just kind of wearing a jacket. And she always refers to Eric as dad or he or he's. She ne- throughout the interview never mentions Eric Richens, like never mentions him by, na- by name. And there are a couple of times when she's asked certain questions, it's really weird. She'll snarl. She like raises her upper uh, lip a little and like just show kind of, you know, uh, you know, she like she doesn't like the question at all. And also she rambles uh, during the interview, just kind of continuing the story. Uh, and why she had to make it. Uh, so, yeah, so that's, you know, the book comes out in, uh, I guess, March. And then on April, you know, it's, it's, meanwhile, it's like doing really well. Like a lot of people are buying this book. She's making appearances, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, obviously when this happens, the book is pulled. Uh, you can't even find it anywhere. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, so, you know, this is, it's kind of a pretty classic case because most women, when they do murder, they do tend to poison, um, which was a little different from our case last week where she actually used the gun. Um, and she yeah. also was arrested for possession of GHB, um, which is a drug that makes you pass out. Um and it's it's a narcolepsy drug, and it's often referred to as liquid ecstasy. But isn't GHB also the um, eight. the 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 rape uh, drug, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I couldn't find a place where they talked about that she had used that to try to poison him, because I would think that the fentanyl pills would have done it. Right. Um, but they seem again, the police did a great job and they followed the leads and it looks yeah. like they got their woman. Yeah. And, uh, we, sh- I think her trial is starting, starting up in about two weeks. Yeah. So, June 12th. No bond. Yeah, no bond. And, uh, we shall see, see what the good people of Utah think about her and the prosecution's case. But I think um, my money is on her 
on her doing it for the money. And uh, according to contract, I believe she was due to write two more books following this because mm. it did so well. And there's also speculation she wrote this book to uh, help her with her debt. Like all well, the yeah. things that come in, she's like, great, like I'm broke. Yeah, you know? did you ever find out where she was living or was that still being um, in the part of the suing portion with the sister? Right, because I would sister. think, yeah, because I would, would think custody. that she would be, yeah, because I would think that A, they would get custody and B, that they would get kicked out of that house. Right. So, I mean, what's fascinating to me really about this case is like, if I go back here, she... They get married in, is it, they get married in 2020? Uh, no. Oh, 2013. 2013. 2013. So, you know, that's a, that's a bit of time, right? And it's kind of like, uh, you know, he keeps saying, no, you know, can I have some money for this? And then she's just going to take it. She has access to them some money. It doesn't, you know, and then they have the three children. But nine, she seven, starts. Five. But she starts stealing money from him within three years. Right. I mean, she starts stealing money in 2016. So she was stealing before 2016. Because per the probate court petition documents, they said by 2016, she was already pulling money out of his house. I mean, out of his accounts. Right. And she's still unaware that her name was taken off, I believe, at this point. Uh, well, because that's still 2016, because then in right. 2020 is where he's like, oh, my gosh, I got to, you know, do something about this. But they also have like little kids. So I'm thinking, like, who is right. taking care of her kids as she's being a realtor and flipping houses? I mean, the kids are young. Yeah. Um, In 2016, because where are they? They um nine, seven and five. five. So they're like yeah. two years apart, each yeah. one. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I just like. I mean, I think it's one of those cases, you know. This uh, this guy is really afraid of, uh, you know, he wants to make it work, but you know, other than calling your sister, he doesn't share it with anyone. Well, but he does tell his friends that my wife is trying to poison me, and that's after... not until the Valentine's Day. Oh, yeah, like, but the Valentine's Day. Extent. So, but I'm like. If your wife's trying to poison you on Valentine's Day, get the hell out of that house with right. your children and like right. go. Like, it's interesting because it's like, you know, sometimes people joke about that in a ha-ha funny way, but it's like, he's getting physically, like, ill, passing out. Like, I just, it's it's so hard for me to imagine him getting out, not getting out. Right. I mean, it's, uh, you know, could could we assume that Dan saw Nancy Brophy's blog article? You know what I mean? Like, did you be able to see, like, you know, how to murder your husband? And I'm writing about, like, killing, you know, a husband and stuff. You know, like, maybe maybe he thinks it's, maybe he's just like, all right, she, you know, like, what? yeah, it boggles my mind that it's the second time it's on Valentine's Day. And then just to tell your friends and family, hey, you know, if I die, it's probably It's my wife. But he doesn't report it, you know? That's fascinating. Like, he doesn't. And then it's weird because it's like, hey, I'm a parent. Like, I got to be here for my family, for yeah. my children. And this isn't and family happening. was obviously very, very important to him. Right. He really hoped to keep his family together. And this is, I wonder, where his religion came into play. Because, you know, family is such a huge part of Mormonism that I don't necessarily know that they look down on divorce, like, say, maybe the Catholics do. But at the same time this idea of keeping your family close. Like I'm wondering if that, you know, belief in family kind of let him not fully act towards these danger signals that were happening um, with this woman who I actually don't know. Do you know if she was Mormon too? Uh, I don't know, actually. But I'm, you know, now that we're talking about it, perhaps that was the rift with his first marriage. You know, you spend time uh, as a missionary, right, uh, for your faith. You come back, you get married, and there is this uh, really contentious divorce. I-, I can only, if my mind wanders, assume that perhaps she didn't want to be a part of that world, and that's why maybe it was like so hard. 
so Corey, I don't know. I mean, uh, a lot, listen, a lot of where they are, uh, where they were living at this time was, uh, Mormon, you know, that was, uh, the very popular faith at the time in this well, area. Still is. Still is. I mean, still is. <laughs> this, is, this is still just like a year. This is within like a couple of months ago. So yeah, no, this is, uh, but being, and maybe that was uh, the beginning of everything, his family acknowledging that she's not a Mormon, you know, and her not liking his family because, no, I'm not a Mormon, but I love your husband. Uh, and, uh, you know, that could be another factor. It's just like, I can't live in this crazy world. But no, either way you look at it, this was definitely a predetermined uh, act on her part, you know. Yeah, she, no, she definitely. definitely knew what she was doing and uh you know it would have been great if they could uh and maybe they will if they can interview uh whatever child was having the night terrors and she went in and saying it was bad and then you know left maybe uh who knows like how were the children notified you know that's you know a paramedic showed up and there were no signs that she performed cpr on him yeah uh, you know and the and the interesting thing is, and this is actually, I was just remembering that when I originally saw this and saw about how much she kind of used her grief um, to kind of make a name for herself, yeah. it made me think of Munchausen syndrome. So Munchausen syndrome by proxy tends to be somebody, it tends to be a mother, uh, I think it's mothers usually. Uh, poisoning their children to get attention and support from their community as their kids are really sick. Yeah. Um, it almost feels like, yes, yeah, she killed him for his money, but then because she wasn't initially arrested for it, she kind of used that as a way to make a name for herself and to yeah. get attention from people and um, she would constantly be posting on Facebook about how much she missed him and how hard it was being a single mom. Oh. And so it has that like um, kind of taste of something like the Munchausen syndrome where they, uh, they, are, they are hurting somebody to get attention for themselves. And in this matter, she actually killed him. And as now I was reaping the benefits of all the grief and she has the three young kids and how hard it is and how much they miss him, which is she actually came up her her came up with a concept of what she called the three C's right. um, as connection, continuity and care. And she made videos about that, um, that his spirit was always alive in, in their home and that that is still here. It's just in a different way. So she's like really um, uh, milking it as it were. Yeah, yeah. And and being the person who actually caused it. So fascinating case. We will yeah. keep abreast of it to see earlier, what happens. I meant, uh, I meant premeditated, not predetermined. Yeah, pre uh, pre premeditated. I, and it, it, yeah, it's like flashbacks to Susan Smith. Now they mentioned the Munchausen, right? You know, she puts her kids in the car and oh my God. and. Uh, you know, I like that she, it, it's just so mind boggling to me that if she didn't kill him, you know, that's not the response you would have. She goes and parties. She's very excited. I, you know, I believe off the bat, she's a narcissist. I don't think she's a psychopath. You know, I don't think she falls into being a sociopath either. It seems to me like she knows what she's doing, you know? Well, there was actually, and I think we've mentioned this podcast before, it's, I don't think it's, um, it's not like it's defunct, but it still exists. It was called Red Handed. And mm -hmm. it was talking about white collar criminals who get caught. And when they get caught because of the way that their minds work, they end up killing, which is mm -hmm. why she called it Red Handed. Mm -hmm. um, and this almost feels a little bit like that too, where she is a white collar criminal stealing from her husband. Mm -hmm. um, money and obviously doing a very poor job of flipping these houses since she's getting sued by the people who buy the houses from her. Um, and I wonder if she started deciding, oh, I have to kill him when he confronted her in 2020, being like, I know you've stolen my money. Mm -hmm. um, because for a lot of profilers, they talk about how um, you don't 
the most dangerous time for somebody is when they accuse a close associate of fraud Mm. because there's this issue of I'm going to get caught. You're taking away everything away from me. You've put me into a corner and, you know, 2020, exactly. And 2020 is around the time of that Greece trip. Mm. And so yeah. that was the first time. And and then now, like, what business is she having um, buying a 20,000 square foot mansion? And he's saying no. And they did have an argument about that. So it's yeah. again, like, she's getting pushed into the wall. Her fraud schemes are coming out. And she's mm. like, well, I'm gonna, I'm going to make this go away. So I have the freedom I got the millions of dollars to just go on my happy way doing the things that I want to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also getting attention for it because there is that uh, pathology. I mean, it should be very curious to see what her trial is going to look like. Maybe we do a, um, as her trial starts, we do a yeah. uh, another episode talking about what the prosecutors come out with. Because I am very curious to hear what the prosecutors, like if they do get a um psychologist on the stand or like yeah. how she puts herself That's on the I stand like to too i yeah. mean nancy brophy was kind of an open and shut case right yeah yeah uh i mean so. this feels kind of like an open and shut case too quite honestly absolutely uh you know i have to ask you this if i called you saying hey you know my wife just poisoned me and if i die it's going to be because of her what would you do i mean do you keep that to yourself you call the authorities you know no, that's a, I, I mean i would put people in like what would you do well the thing is as a sister i would probably like come with my car with the kids being like get in the car take the kids you're getting a divorce if your family right 100%. if you're a friend you'd probably take the guy and be like dude go get yourself tested to see what was your what was in your system to figure out what made you ill and get the hell out of that house for the security of your children so yeah. I think in either way, like I don't think I would take it as a joke, especially since I'm sure his friends and his family already knew that she stole a lot of money from him. So this is already somebody who is a criminal by doing that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would probably show up with a car being like, OK, she stole your money. I yeah. know you want the kids. Grab the kids. Let's go to an attorney's office. Let's serve divorce papers. Go move into your nice, you know, your parents house at the ranch. Yeah try to get custody of them like especially because he got violently ill like it wasn't like he passed out after that sandwich so and because of what happened in greece too like it's interesting but again we don't know how much this like idea of family affects him so it's and his faith and his faith so uh, that's i I think that has to be taken into consideration as to why he didn't get out of the house so let's be thankful she didn't do this to the children as well you know yeah yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so that was the case of Corey Rishans, which we will find out what's going to happen to her next. And stay in tune for next week. I'm not sure what we're going to do next, but it'll be fun. See, now, what would, <laughs> I, if I may, uh-huh. here's an afterword. If uh, one of the children grows up and writes a book, Mommy's in Jail, it'll be a bestseller. You're right. Full circle. Full circle. Full circle. All right, everybody. Till next week. Thanks. This episode was sponsored by The Creek Killer, book one in the Harriet Harper thriller series written by me, Dominica Best. What would you do if you read The Police Found Your Body in a Creek? Find out in The Creek Killer, available on Amazon. Thank you for joining me and listening to this episode. If you like my show, please give me a rating and review. It helps other listeners find this podcast. Follow Dominica Best Presents The Deviant Mind wherever you listen to your podcasts. Visit thebeststorytellingnetwork.com where you'll find show notes, my books, links to social media, and much more. Join my Patreon for special subscriber perks, like two extra exclusive episodes a month and a Q&A with me at patreon.com forward slash the deviant mind podcast. 
Until next time.